Now we have um, a session that uh, Aspen has called Big Food and the change that it can make. And I feel really fortunate because three of the biggest change makers in the entire food industry from around the world have traveled to Aspen to be with us today. Um, and we're going to talk about what perceptions of, of big food are and what realities are. And we'll invite you all to think with us about what are the changes that remain to be made uh, and, and that should be made. And I will go down the panel and ask them to describe some of their, some of their efforts within their companies. We have Fiona Dawson, uh, who has long been in the UK for Mars and recently, as of 2015, um, uh, yeah, global president of our food and drinks business. Thank you. And um, it's so fortunate to be able to find my media peers who write terrific profiles, um, the most distinguished and best agricultural and policy reporter in the country from Politico, Lena Bodemiller Evich is one of them. Uh, and she's with us in the audience. Um, who write, and I found a wonderful Irish Times profile of Fiona. So um, you will know that she is a flute player. If you, if you, that, that's one of the unusual facts about her. And you are both going to have to provide unusual facts about yourself. Um, Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> we, I'm so glad it's a small audience. We have, we have, yes, that's right. Nothing goes beyond this room. We have Paul Gribwood from Nestle, who's the US CEO, also long active in the United Kingdom for Nestle and in its global business, because of course these have global reach, these companies. Um, and we'll be talking about a lot of the changes Nestle has made and is in the process of making. And then we have Jeff Dunn, the president of Campbell Fresh, which is the first fresh foods division uh, Campbell's has ever had. You probably know his work from Bolt House Farms, where after 21 years, at Coca-Cola, uh, he decided to use all of his marketing savvy, savvy toward fresh foods and things like baby carrots and rebranding them and marketing it so that they seemed accessible and desirable um, in, in ways that had been just for uh, another kind of packaged food. So I'd, I'd like to invite uh, unusual facts about yourselves, Paul and Jeff. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand over to you what I think. <laughs> uh, Unusual thing about myself. Oh, well, I put myself through college bartending, and I say to people many times that most of what I learned about humanity I learned by talking to people across a bar. And the older I get, the more true that becomes. So watch what you say to Jeff. I, th <laughs> I think that's the, that's the lesson of that. Paul. Unusual fact. Uh, I'm not sure there's anything that unusual. One thing, I love photography. So everywhere I go in my satchel, which I'll try not to bring this afternoon, um, is I carry my camera everywhere. And just, yeah, so I might take something like a 1,000 photos a, uh, a week or something along those lines. Well, then the challenge is to take a photo at Aspen that hasn't been taken before because the natural beauty attracts so many, mm -hmm. so many people. So, Fiona, we were talking about um, what big food connotes to a lot of people and what you wanted it to connote to workers at Mars. So could you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, this is something that's quite interesting for me, having grown up in the food industry. I've spent sort of 28 years working in this business, and um, we've shared uh, many, a, many a, an industry group that we've worked together on, on really, really transformational issues. And what's deeply, deeply saddened me over the last decade, I guess, has been the fact that big food has become somehow a pejorative, it's a bad term. Big food is bad business, it's interest in the bottom line, it's interest in somehow swindling consumers. Um, and not, uh, well, I guess you will always find out, Lars, but certainly knowing the businesses that we run, nothing could be further than the truth. Um, and where we started off uh, a couple, quite a few years ago now is actually, um, particularly as a candy company, we wanted our associates to be incredibly proud of the businesses they work in. Um, and for us, it's incredibly important that they are represented. It's why I come to events like this, to be honest with you, is you know, people think about um, big food as an anonymous business. And actually, if you could see our 80,000 employees or associates, as we call them, or the 4,000 I have working on food, they are as passionate about delivering our purpose, which is better food today, better world tomorrow, 
Um, they're passionate about nutrition, about taste, their families, they cook and eat and love our products. And for me, I want to rewrite the narrative around big food. Big food can do important and transformational things in the food industry. And it's only by following our consumers and giving them what they want that we will remain relevant for the future. It's also very important that you say that your workers are also consumers of your product. Absolutely. Because I, I have interviewed people and met people who market for large food companies who say that they go, they have focused their talents on the the bad for you or the or the really worse for you products um, that they would never dream of having themselves. And so that's a very different message from what you're talking about. Um, you know, that they all go home and have artisan products and we're gonna be talking about the elite versus what's mm -hmm. affordable and accessible. But you think that your your consumers really one hundred percent. I mean, this is where it started. We had a you know everyone has a a vision, and many years ago we had one, and it talked about pride. And the I in pride was I believe in trust in our brands and our products. It was internal. We didn't go external with it, and it's what I wanted our associates to say, particularly as candy started to come into the firing line in terms of the very understandable obesity debate that it's, that's out there. But you know, the interesting thing is, whether you talk to mums uh, like myself, I've got teenage boys, um, you know, I've been in India recently talking to mums in really disadvantaged situations. They want the same things for their kids. They want to, them to eat healthily, to eat well, they want them to do well in school, they want them to get off their smartphone. You know, it, it, our circumstances are different, but we're united in common sets of values, and I think we need to remember that as we go forward. Great, um, and I'm gonna drill down a number of questions that you're actually, uh, changes you're actually making to bring this into effect, but why don't we go to Paul. The perceptions of big food, why you've chosen to make your career in it, and, and some of the misunderstandings you think around the idea of. Yeah, I, I, it's, it, it, I, I share a lot of uh, the same views as uh, uh, Fiona here, but w one of the things that Nestle, last week we opened up uh, um, a museum uh, in the same town that we originally started in, which is in Veve in Switzerland. And I'm talking, this is, this is a town the size of Aspen, okay? And still today, it has this corporate head office in it, which is the world's biggest food and drink company. So we didn't move out to New York or to London or to wherever it was. We're still in the same little village that we started off with. And, and yeah, the building got a bit bigger, but the philosophy is still the, the same. And when you work in our organization, you don't feel as though you're in big food because that's not the type of operation. We don't see food as you know, a global mindset, a global standard. We see food very locally. And uh, I guess after 150 years and the business model is such that it's got us to the scale and size that we must be doing something right. And, and the big driver of 150 years of success is actually that we focus everything locally because food tastes are very local. So there are certain things that you can, you can look at globally, you know, the big food. So you can have a global research center, uh, for example, on, on dairy, uh, you know, uh, whether that's uh, cheese production, milk, cream, as whatever, you can have a go. But in actual fact, when you come down to local tastes, local requirements, local sourcing, local, well, actually, it's all got to be local. And so, you know, an example of that, um, which I gave the other day, I mean, it was only last week again on Tuesday that I, I was actually walking around farms in Northern California uh, with families. Um, we basically have um, 11 families or 11 herds, uh, same thing, uh, who we've been working with for 32 years. For, you, for, for carnation. Carnation. For the carnation product. So you can't get more local than that. I think the furthest uh, is 11 miles that one of those herds is away from the, uh, away from the plant. And so it's so local and so fully integrated that it allows us to get the highest standards of animal welfare, the highest standards of product quality, um, and a relationship which allows us to invest in each other that, that gives you that certainty and continuity. So I understand that when somebody sees the Nestle annual report and they pick it up and they go, wow, that's a big number at the front. But we, we don't view our business as big. We view it as very local, and the cumulative effects of those individual businesses are significant. And I would just, just say one other thing. We don't, um, we, we don't actually have one 
head office, if you will, in the US, we've got 139 sites. And we've got 139 sites because we believe in that locality. Um, and uh, yes, there are certain, you know, for example, up in Wisconsin, I've got a couple of factories up there. Why? Because they buy nothing but Wisconsin cheese, and we want to be near that local source. Um, and you know, we've got big pet food business further south. Why? Because we're we're, we're near the grain harvest. Uh, and so and so, food, uh, th this global thing, and this glo what global does bring you, what big food does bring you, is the scalability to invest uh, in a variety of areas, be that food safety, food quality, uh, to invest in your people, uh, and actually to invest in some sustainability practices that quite frankly, smaller businesses genuinely ne couldn't necessarily afford. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Yeah, I, I guess I'd take a, a different tack on, on big food, you know, and big anything these days is generally pejorative, big government, you know, institutions have all come under stress because institutions have behaved in ways that I think for the average person they feel very disconnected. Brexit, you know, you can just run down the list of, uh, you know, a populist movement taking place. I think what's behind this uh, pejorative orientation to big food and present companies accepted, I think your companies are doing great things. There are some other players who seem to want to block progressive policies and it becomes very much a short term uh, orientation, Mars being a private company, isn't necessarily at the whip of Wall Street. Nestle, a European company, not necessarily at the whip of Wall Street, but American-based companies, Wall Street activist investors create a scenario where you get very short term that drives you to a mindset around not being progressive because that generally means investment. And as a result, uh, the consumer is the one who's paid the price. And the exporting of the Western diet I don't think has been the best thing that's ever happened to the world. I mean, the unintended consequences of uh, obesity rates around the world, uh, disease states associated with obesity, and ultimately the food business, uh, you know, it's changing today, but when, when I left Coke 15 years ago, refusing to even admit that they had anything to do with the obesity crisis when clearly uh, they did. So I think we have to rebuild trust. I mean, I said yesterday in one of the sessions on fixing the broken food system that trust starts with being trustworthy and taking actions. Uh, many of the actions taken by the company sitting at this, this table that start to rebuild that trust. But I think it's a long road. I think the trust gap, uh, and it's not just a US phenomenon, it's around the world. So not just perceptions, but I'll put you on the firing line because you are, because Campbell's is a publicly held company and you are subject to the whip of Wall Street. And so Campbell took this, are you, are you still in a honeymoon privileged phase where, so Campbell had never been in the fresh business and in the perimeter and was seeing that, is it 70% of sales among millennials was going to the perimeters and, and many of them never came in for shelf stable packaged foods and decided we have to build a whole cold supply chain which it had never had and we want to be part of that action. But, so presumably that would mean they have a long range focus because they've never been in that business. So they want to give you a leash, but you know, how much do they jerk that leash and, and how strongly do you feel the pressure of quarterly earnings? Well, after being out of public company life, being in private equity for 15 years, being back in it, there is certainly an orientation to quarters. You know, every quarter comes up and you're reporting and you're getting your, you know, scorecards. So, there tends to be um, a, a different cadence to the business. And if you want to take a long-term investment strategy, much like Campbell's has done with, with Campbell's Fresh, uh, with margins that are half of what their core business are, we've got growth, but not the margins. But importantly, we know we're in the space, certainly in North America, that the consumer is going to. So you have to be willing to take a little uh, heat along the way. And I don't think, I think the honeymoon, sometime two or three days after the closing, I think the honeymoon ended because you've got to report, uh, you know, progress. But at the heart of it, uh, you know, I give Campbell's a lot of credit because uh, they believe that they needed to get, uh, you know, a new platform. I know Nestle has made a huge global move into nutrition and that required investment and a mindset and just got a new CEO or announced a, a new CEO coming from more of the health sciences side of the, the universe. So I think everybody's dealing with these big macro strategies and each company will decide how to invest into it. But I don't see in any case these longer term growth opportunities immediately being accretive to earnings. So you have to make a story for Wall Street and, and really uh, 
you know, have a lot of clarity about how this thing's going to emerge. But look, from, from my point of view, it's, uh, so again, certainly in North America, this is not a fad. This is a structural change that's going to go on, you know, for a long time. So, thanks. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to stick with Jeff at your, at your terrible expense for two minutes because I'd like to go down and shift to nutrition and changes that you're making in nutrition. So, what was Campbell's long-term message that they wanted to send by um, getting into the fresh food business what are the overall guidelines? Do you have nutrition guidelines, which is what I'm about to talk about, internal nutrition guidelines, that you impose on products so that it's the idea, the public health idea of changing the default environment so that there is, that all the products you make adhere to a certain set of standards? Is it from the very fact that you're fresh, it's going to be better for you and you're aiming for the least processed result available so that by its nature is going to be, or you know, do you have a set of guidelines? And then the graduate level question you don't have to answer is, is there going to be any interchange with the packaged, shelf-stable, and canned products? Yeah, I, I'd say generally fresh has more of a health halo than, than shelf-stable food, you know, so you get a bit of that. But more importantly for us, it's really about uh, um, plant-based nutrition. So as we think about kind of plant-based going forward, how do we get more fruits and vegetables fresh or minimally processed into people's diets. The, the one thing we can say unequivocally, nutritionists are like economists. They all kind of disagree at the margin about a lot of things, but they agree we need to get more fruits and vegetables into people's diets. So the combination of fresh orientation to fruits and vegetables, you know, clear nutritional guidelines in terms of things like added sugars and calories and, and having a balanced nutrition. But more importantly, you know, in some ways, teaching the consumer, again, how to cook. I mean, one of, one of the things we've seen is, you know, half the households in the United States now are single households. So, you know, convenience has to play and value, as we talked about earlier, have to play critical roles. Uh, and, and these are products that have um, really different shelf life, requires um, a, a lot of intense focus when you're, you know, dealing with 30, 60 day shelf life products. But at the heart of it, we think this shift is really about getting people back to eating whole foods as much as possible and understanding where their foods come from, what it does to them, and ultimately, how does it fit a healthy lifestyle? And that, the great news is we're seeing signs of that across communities and health professionals and food companies. Everybody's getting the game because I think we've all gotten a little um, upset, probably is a good word, about the unintended consequences of the last 50 years in the food business. I, I, I find it um, fa fascinating to just sit in, in this environment and listen to the, the, the interpretation of fresh and, and big food and so on and so forth. I took, um, I took some folks, we, uh, we have a brand called Stouffer's, which has uh, been with us for, gosh, I think it was 1934 or something along those lines that the, the brand was started off. And um, we were working on some new recipes. So we, um, we actually brought 16 chefs, um, quite well-regarded, well-known chefs from around the country. No big, no big deal. Um, and one of the things I absolutely agree with you on is um, people's ability to, to cook and understand how to put the most basic of meals together and to understand what they've created, what the calories they've created, roughly, you know, and what you the sort people, of nutrition... You mean the professional chefs you brought to no, Well, <laughs> that might have been true for one or two of them, but I mean the general populace. Um, and we were talking at a, a, a breakfast meeting I had this morning about, you know, when I was a, a young fellow at school, we used to have this uh, thing called home economics, which everybody, all the guys hated to do because you had to wear this pinny thing. But it gave you the basics of 12 recipes to cook, it gave you, gave you the understanding of what your weight roughly should be in terms of height and so on and so forth. It gave you the real basics of wellness. And a lot of people don't have that. But, but going back to this... I'm just going to interrupt for a sec. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's come here is named Hugh Atchison. He's a celebrity chef. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to revive uh, home economics in oh. public school and make it acceptable to boys, which it was becoming when it still continued. But it started going the way of music programs and sports Absolutely. and all the public education enhancements that have been axed. Well, I, well I, have to, I have to say, it's, it's amazing around the world how, how many places this was taken out and then gets put back. And, and I mean, you only have to look at what we spend as, uh, uh, in, on, you know, our medical cost as a percentage of GDP here to actually see that our, that our life expectancy rate is no better for double the rate of expenditure. 
uh, here in the US, and, and we've got a complete imbalance. And we can talk about the ed education at the very beginning and giving people the tools to take responsibility for their own personal wellness. But one of the things that I think big food has lost, the, the going back to the Stouffer's question, is, is basically on, on really, we took these chefs in and they came expecting this thing called processed. And they were looking around and they were going, so where do you process this? So we introduced them to our chefs. So the guys that make fresh pasta every day, uh, the guys who make the sauce every day, uh, the guys who are tasting on the line to make sure the sauces are right, the guys who are making sure that the absolute right amount of sodium goes in versus who guidelines, not versus a good shake of the pot, et cetera, et cetera. And these guys came away going, we, we, we came away with a completely different perception. And one of the- Can you paint the picture of what the kitchen looks like? Because we're imagining maybe some stainless steel in a couple of- Yeah, you are, you are. Um, you know, I guess, I guess I've, I've changed the name of it because people would have called it a factory before. But something would be, um, it would probably be the size of this room. That's the size of the kitchen. And literally you will have uh, raw materials coming in here all that have been individually checked, hand-checked, uh, all for quality standards, and then effectively you start like you would at home. There's a very big mixing bowl in here to start and make the pasta, uh, except we don't put half a pound of you know, um, whole flour in, we probably put something like 20 pounds a batch or something along those lines. It's a bigger scale. But actually what the chefs could see as we went round was actually this is no different from what I actually do. And one of the things with big food that, that, that I think we've got to get out of is we have got to be a thousand percent transparent, a thousand percent transparent. So taking the local community around our big kitchens, taking through our supply chain, answering any question that anybody wants to ask about our business is what big food has to do. Because actually part of the issue that big food has in terms of its uh, you know, conversations, especially here in the US, is the fact that it wasn't transparent. It fought by a different set of rules. It wasn't open and honest and open to question. And so it's like, it's like walking into a garage forecourt buying a new car and saying, do, that, do those wheels come with this car? And the guy says, well, maybe. You know what I mean? Well, when people ask you, so what was in your product? What does this actually mean? Do you put X in your product? It's, uh, I think, you know, you go back a 10-year period and a lot of big food companies actually refute, why do you need to know? Why do you need, you just, we just tell you and you should be happy with that. Well, at the end of the day, that's, that's not the world we live in. That's not the paradigm that's out there anymore. And so I think, you know, part of this, the erosion of, of, of uh, you know, improving this position that people are, is that everything we do is local. Everything we do has to be transparent. We have to be accountable for everything. And one of the things that we've, done as a, a company, not just globally, but here in the US, we've actually said, we'll be very accountable. And we produced a thing called um, a creating shared value document. And you look at it and you go, oh, it's a piece of paper and a little booklet, and I'm sure that's very nice. But what it does do is in all transparency, whether it's the amount of sugar we use, the salt we use, the water we use, our environmental credentials, sourcing, the way we look after our staff, it's a commitment that says, three years ago we were here. Today we're here and in the future we're going there. And its availability is open to everybody to basically look at our business and say, is that a well-run, open, honest, and transparent business? That's the way you get around, I think. Great, I'm about to ask you about where the there is and what determined the there, but let's get to Fiona, who I think also believes a lot in transparency. Yeah, no, we, absolutely we do. Um, I, I'm actually, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm a big fan of the center of the store in CPG which is probably not the sexiest thing to talk about at the moment, um, because still tens of millions of our consumers shop there day in, day out. Um, and if you look at, you've asked, you know, do you have specific nutrition guidelines? Yes, absolutely we do. We've adopted all of the WHO nutrition guidelines, of course, all of their criteria. Um, the sodium levels go beyond those recommended in the draft um, proposal by the FDA, sugars, etc. Um, and we'll reformulate gradually there. And, and the reason we're gradual is what we believe we can do, and I know other companies firmly believe it is, we need to retrain the palate of nations. So if you suddenly took all the sodium out, actually people would either reject your product, we've all had a couple of those in the past where people, you go too low sodium, actually people say I don't want to buy it anymore, and they switch into higher sodium products, or they add it in. 
in the process, which kind of defeats the purpose. So we want to retrain palates as we go forward. The other thing we're looking to do is very similar to Jeff. We're looking at plant-based protein, plant-based meals, adding more grains into people's diets. So 50% of our products will have grains as we go forward, more fruit and veg. Um, and then really what moms are looking for is they're looking for inspiration. Um, we know that people will have roughly a repertoire of, of 10 meals that they'll dip into. And they're looking for empty plates uh, from their, their kids, because otherwise it's a waste of time, a waste of money. I'm not doing a good job as a mom. And while celebrity chefs are great, and I love them, um, and we work with a lot of them, they sometimes feel they're preached to a little bit too much. So we um, did this, what we thought was going to be experiment, but was really interesting, actually, in Australia. We've got the biggest food business in Australia, Master Foods. And we started to put recipes on the back of our pack that included more lean protein and more um, fruit and veg in, in the diet. And over the period of a year, because we tracked it, we found that 90% of people actually followed the recipes on the back of our packs. And we had introduced an incremental 15 million portions of fruit and veg into people's diets. So what people are looking for is not necessarily pure health. They're looking for healthier. Help me make it a tiny touch healthier. Mm -hmm. Let me swap out the minced beef for minced turkey. Let me have confidence that everybody's going to eat it. I don't want to be a bad mom. I don't want my kids not to eat healthily, but I do want to eat them to help them to eat what we cook. Is there a product you can think of that reduces the sodium levels? Because I know you were very involved in European initiatives yeah. to reduce s sodium and salt that was withdrawn. And Jeff, while she's thinking, can I put you on the spot to recall Campbell's experience, even though you weren't there then, I don't think? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I wasn't there, so it's hard for me to speak directly, but, but the, you know, the, the facts are there was a huge effort uh, made to, to reduce sodium levels. Uh, th there was uh, very little consumer acceptance of those, those products, and so the decision was made to create a full range, so you've got products that are very low sodium now, all the way through mid sodium, and then, you know, trying to bring down the sodium levels in the kind of legacy products. And those reformulations are challenging, as Fiona said. Uh, you've got, you know, my friends at Pepsi just announced they're going back to aspartame on Diet Pepsi because the hardcore Diet Pepsi users rejected sucralose. So, and you've got a core uh, group of consumers who love your product. They're very sensitive to change, so it's not as simple as just making the change because you know there's a bottom line impact, but there's also a huge now with social media a huge consumer impact. I mean, so it's it's one of these things that's not simple, but I think what's happening, which is productive, is I think everybody is now saying across the board, whether it's in fresh food or or, or shelf stable food, that we need to get more presence of positives uh, in the food. Uh, we've done a lot of work, and, and I think most big companies have, are in some stage of re removing artificials and those kinds mm -hmm. of things. But that's just kind of ante up to the game, in my opinion. I think the future, we actually have gone to school on what Master Foods did in Australia. is brilliant because they help people bring fresh fruits and vegetables in to their, their recipes. And, you know, it seems like people should understand that, mm -hmm. but they just don't. They're looking for information and inspiration. And I think this is something that Nestle is doing with its pizza line is it which which brand of pizza well, is it well we've done we've done i mean in terms of overall in you know in this guy overall 10 percent reduction in sodium reduction in sugar etc etc no artificial cause preservatives etc you know all of the the stuff that it wraps up to but but it is interesting to point the palate is is something that is and your taste palate is something that's really established early on in life it's not something that you sort of pick up you know in in middle age and so one of the challenges that we've actually got as, a, as a, a set of food companies is trying to get a line on what the end objective is. I remember when I came to the US four years ago, the average sodium um, consumption, um, the average American is about 3,845 milligrams. That's, you know, a variety of different sources put that together. Well, the World Health Organization says roughly 2,000 uh, milligrams of sodium a day. When I arrived here, there was an article written that said, um, and we had a debate with uh, a discussion with the FDA on 1,500. The movement to go from 3,845 to 1,500 is almost an impossible movement. Uh, it will be instant rejection 
in terms of your, your, the consumers that use it. And so sometimes I think you know, this glide path on the pallet is we have to have a bit of a reality check. Mm -hmm. 1500 is way beyond even where the WHO goes. So, let, so let's talk about 2000, 2500. How do we create the journey together? And by the way, this is not just about food companies. This is about people recognizing at home that that extra bit of salt off the table. I love going to restaurants where they don't have any condiments on it. I love a pompous chef that says, my food is so well salted, you don't need anything. That, that's great for me because... Your food is usually so oversalted. Salted, you exactly. Really don't need well, it. Um, <laughs> we would say that 75%, so remember calories, in home, out of home, roughly 50-50. Sodium, 75% of the sodium intake is actually out of home now. So when you get to a point where I might take 10%, I might take 20% out, you know, you've eaten out recently and you come, you take one of my products and you go, that is tasteless, yeah? And so the pushback from the consumer, I remember we have a product, um, uh, DiGiorno Pizza, and uh, we did some work on the recipe to reduce the overall sodium. Um, and we literally got love it and hate it. We literally got love it and hate it to a point where we had to put the other one back and at the same time, give a healthier option for people who wanted to reduce. So we, I think we, what we have to have, and this is something that I think is badly missing, is a vision in sight that everybody is working towards. Because it's not just my food company, it's restaurants, it's our food companies together, it's uh, what you're given in, uh, uh, as, a, as a child uh, at school to eat, the, the meals you're formulating. You have to have a journey to get the health of the nation, set a vision and a path to get to. Because individual elements, we can all do that. And yes, we can improve, but it doesn't provide you with the, the end result you need as quickly as you need it. Something, thank you, something that always puzzles me as a cynical uh, journalist, um, Helena would agree we don't have an ounce of cynicism in our body. Surely not. Nonetheless, um, when I read that you were telling people to have salads with their pizzas, I thought, what's in it for them? Because they, they aren't saying go to buy Campbell Fresh. You know, it, it, you don't have um, a tie-in product that would immediately benefit you. And I think that, Fiona, when you talk about MasterChef and saying, here are more fruits and veg to incorporate with this, I'm not aware that you're in the fresh fruit and veg business in mm -hmm. Australia. So why would you do something so foolhardy? And also, can you talk about Mars also recommending smaller portions and saying, this is a treat or this is high in sodium, but you know, we like it this way, but just don't have it as often? It, it, it is really curious. So, so Paul mentioned transparency is, is the name of the game. And we all know the automobile industry and the, you know, Jeff mentioned, you know, food industry as well has been complicit in terms of lack of transparency. Um, it's really interesting you say that, because when you try to be transparent, they go, why are you doing that? Why would you want to do? I mean, my answer would be, which is kind of glib, on, in terms of recipes and suggestions, why not? I know as a mum myself, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a healthier choice. I've got a really picky 13-year-old, and it has to pass his test. I know that may seem very basic, but that's what I'm looking for. Um, in terms of transparency, so on our candy business, yeah, we announced quite some time ago that we go to no more than 250 kilocals We'd reformulate, take saturated fats out, um, and we're actually now introducing more and more of our ranges below 200 kilocal. But at the end of the day, when people eat chocolate, they are looking for the real deal. They're also saying to us, don't mess with our chocolate. So, um, you know, you've got portions of your portfolio that are clearly in the treat camp. When it comes to main meal, I had a, a personally shocking experience about a month ago. We launched our health and well-being commitments which covered reformulation, um, some of the work that we wanted to do around WHO. And, and there was a small part of it which we said, we're going to be fully transparent in terms of the frequency at which, I don't know whether you saw that, mm -hmm. you probably didn't, the coverage we got, mm -hmm. frequency at which people eat our products. And we've got some things, products, ranges, Italian, like lasagna sauces, real cream sauces, or pesto, high in fat, high in salt. So we said, well, you shouldn't eat that very frequently, probably once a week. Um, it's about 5% of our portfolio. And I was, we'd launched in the US, um, which we'd had a very nice launch. And I was on the plane going home back to the UK. And the Daily Mail, I don't know how many of you know the Daily Mail. The Daily Mail's headline, like front page, was shock, horror, 
company tells people not to buy their products. So by the time, I didn't sleep very well, as you can imagine. By the time I landed in the UK, not only was this headline in the Daily Mail, it was the headline in the BBC, the ITV, Sky News. We had three billion media impressions over the course of two days. And what it realized for me is, A, people are cynical about why would we be transparent? Um, and why would we want to help? But also people are hungry to have the debate of what is real food, what should you eat, when should you eat it, because people are confused. Mm. You know, we have all been complicit um, in terms of high fat, but it's actually, you know, or low fat, should I say, it's still high in salt, <coughs> or low sodium, low sugar, it's high in calories. What is healthy labeling? I think we need to clean up our labels, I need to be truly transparent about what's inside, and let the consumer choose. If they want to have a lasagna on a Friday night, a glass of wine, perfectly happy. I know that's how I'd choose to wind down. Also, thank you. The, the it's a bit of a beg bug for me. <laughs> well, when, what I have to ask is, did sales of pesto sauce go down? No, no, they don't. Probably well, went up. <laughs> well, yeah. They, you know, people, but people do want to know what's inside the products they're choosing. There's nothing worse than being duped and thinking that you're buying into a low fat or a healthier option and actually finding out it's not what it says in the front. I think we all have to do a lot more in terms of transparency. I, um, my, my grandmother obviously no longer with us, and, uh, but she was a great, great woman from you know, hard economic times. And uh, she had this great expression, and which I use very frequently, I'm about to use now, she used to say, all things in moderation. And, uh, you know, at that time when you think about that second piece of cheesecake or whatever it may be, or, and, and this comes back to the pizza thing, you know, I'm sorry, but I, I love pizza. But I do want it to be served with something else. I do want the portion mm. We even have on, our, on our, our pizza, on the back of our packs, um, our recommended level is below that of, you know, um, the FDA's uh, guidelines, initial guidelines. So what, what creates your criteria? So you have your nutrition commitments that you're going to make, which I would wager to say most people in the audience don't know about and haven't seen. You announced your health and well-being commitments. Um, what goes into deciding uh, what your levels are going to be? Is it what you think consumers will accept? Is it what you think the regulatory bodies in the countries where you're marketing the products are going to require? And also, can you get into trouble by reformulating products based on what you think the current consumer demand is, but might not make sense in the long term nutritionally? That's a really tough question, so that'll be a secondary question. But first talk about what goes into formulating these nutrition guidelines. Well, from our side, it's, it's, it's nothing. We have a thing called uh, the Nutritional Foundation, something we use inside because you can imagine how turned off consumers would be by us saying, so let's talk through this Nutritional Foundation. It's available on our packs. It's available uh, online if you want to go into that depth. But basically, we, take, um, we would take FDA guidelines. We would take uh, IOM Institute of Medicine guidelines. We take World Health guidelines. So for every category and every product that we produce, there is an operating guideline from Nestle that says this product is not good and nutritious if it doesn't deliver against these guidelines uh, in this portion format, okay? And so worldwide, um, when the great and the good travel the world to come and see my business or I travel to see my infant nutrition business or I travel to see my pizza business or whatever, the first question we have, uh, where are you on this? And uh, you get some divisions that go, I'm 100% I'm there uh, and in actual fact we're working on X, Y and Z to improve it. Uh, you'll get other divisions, uh, for example, our confections division. Uh, they'll actually say, you know what, I'm 89% there, but I'm doing this on portion size to, to do this, or I'm actually changing the level of uh, fat that's in a particular product, or reducing sugar, or whatever to get there. So the whole business is moving towards getting the entire portfolio uh, to these nutritional foundations. And because we're a global company, you, you, you can't pick one, but you have to pick... You know, the World Health Organization knows what it's talking about. Uh, it, it's a very um, robust 
uh, highly intellectual organization uh, with the greater good of, of, of the global populace uh, in, in its hands. And you know that's mostly what the Nutritional Foundation is behind. And so that's what we work towards all the time. And, and when we can't get there, we've got a choice. We've got a choice. When we can't get there, we we can either um, be a little bit quiet and secretive about it, but that doesn't work, and we're a transparent company, so that won't happen. Uh, we work to look at, the, as I said, the portion guides, or actually, this is when we bring our technologists in and our R&D center to say things like, how are you gonna get to the next stage? So I'll give you an example on, on, on salt. Very difficult because of the palate to take salt reduction down uh, much further. But we're working on something at the moment and currently being tested where um, a salt molecule is, is a solid. But when you put a piece of salt on your tongue, you don't hold that piece of salt on your tongue for very long until you actually take it into the body. So at the end of the day, it's almost like a touch and go scenario that you need to have so that you don't have to. So you almost create a hologram of salt rather than a filled cube, if that makes sense. That's something that we as a company are working on. Other companies are working. We're not unique in that. Other companies are working I mean, that. If you the were unique on it, you wouldn't be announcing it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, and openness and transparency and cynical journalism, you see. So, but, but, but in actual fact, no, we would. But, but, it, but isn't that interesting that we actually can do certain things by just using common sense, good practice, to do it, but actually technology can then potentially take us on further uh, uh, to, a, to a point where we can improve the health of the nation. So that's what we use in terms of NF. That's great. Fiona, went into, what went into your guidelines? And, and why don't you reveal something to us that's completely secret that nobody <laughs> knows? <laughs> I, think I, I think I managed to tell us on that Friday to everybody. Um, so yeah, we, we were very similar. We used the WHO guidelines as well. Um, and very similar, it, it is a glide path in terms of how you get there. We're not scientists. I think we need to be... Um, really careful. It's interesting, Jeff, talking about the unintended consequences of reformulation. Um, you know, what we need to do is make sure that we have the most up-to-date nutrition advice. But even running a business as I do now, and as long as I've been in, in the food industry, you know, you see changes in opinion on saturated fat. You see mm. changes in, and you're going, so what's going to change next? And am I working with the best possible knowledge, which is why we would be very similar to Paul and say, we're gonna leave it up to the real experts in this field, we're gonna take advice for them and make sure we're aware of any under, unintended consequences of the formulation we do. When I'm, uh, I'm gonna ask for questions, but I just have to register that I'm hurt and offended that you didn't say that it's what writers like Helena and you call for us to do. I didn't hear that once. <laughs> Rats. Corby. <laughs> Darn it. Right. Corby, so, um, um, one, one thing on that that I think is um, important, and we, we, we talk about this idea of collaborative disruption and how do we change the environment in which we all operate. It's very difficult for any individual food company to take this problem on, and we're all taking it on in different ways. Uh, you know, but as we think about it, the First Lady, certainly in the United States, has provided great leadership on some of these issues, and then you just take the school lunch program we talked about yesterday, which we've tried to move towards, whether it's WHO or FDA, but a more standardized set of, of um, conditions for the food in schools where we, many of these kids who don't have access, this is the only place they're getting kind of that balanced, healthy meal. And it's been incredible to me that they're, you know, like you try to do anything good, this is the unintended consequence, there's this backlash yeah. about the nanny state, and, and you know, th that to me is, is pretty incredible, and I think all of us need to stand up and say, you know what, this is not about the nanny state. Uh, this is about having a healthy, vibrant society, and what we need to do is make changes that actually accelerate our progress against that, and, and to some extent, call people out who are trying to be regressive in their mm. point of view on that, and I think these are both progressive companies. I know Campbell's is trying to be progressive, but I think it's all of us making a decision that you know we need for our kids' sake to have a healthier food system, full stop. And I think, and I think if I may, it's a great point. There, there are, there's a balance of companies kicking around the place, but I remember when uh, Nestle made the, uh, the quote that basically, we were for any added sugars being highlighted on, on front of pack. Okay, so this was in the FDA. 
Um, we got quite a lot of flack within our own industry from people saying, why would you do that? Why would you do that? I mean, you know, re really... Well, Mars has done similar stuff, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. but no, absolutely. We get the but, same flag, no, yeah. but we get the same flag. But you actually have companies that still haven't got to the point where they have to recognise that 100% transparency on everything is the only way of gaining confidence. And if you can't explain what you do, then you shouldn't be doing it. That's a good line. Do we have, do we have questions from the audience? We have a gentleman... Uh, why don't we start in the back, though? Um, because our lovely Mike Runner. Um, <laughs> there. Uh, hi, I'm Shabam Pai. I'm from East Hartford, Connecticut, and I'm a Bezos scholar. Question? Yes. Um, so yesterday, Mr. Grimwood, you talked about how food safety was you know, a very important priority. There was zero tolerance for uh, any food safety concerns for children. Is there anything that you know, follows through with nutrition in children? Like, does it have a similar rippling effect in changing, you know, the palates of children will change, you know, how we, how we eat food in the future? I think, I think this, the NF, good question. I mean, the, the NF that we talked about, this nutritional foundation, uh, that, there's pretty much a zero tolerance on that. Uh, I, I mean, you know, for example, my marketeers don't come to me with a product that doesn't deliver NF because it's a pretty short conversation. So if they want to launch something into the kids' space, adult space, whatever it is, if it doesn't hit our nutritional guidelines, you know, um, we're in the process of changing what we have today to make sure it's 100% NF, but no new product gets through into the marketplace if it doesn't deliver. So very much like safety, there's a zero tolerance uh, in our organization uh, against producing something that isn't uh, in line with our guidelines. Thanks. Next, this gentleman, then that gentleman. Uh, can we have the mic right down here? And can you give this gentleman the mic, please? Thank, thank you. This is actually quite interesting. I have little, I'm an old guy with a lot of little, a few little kids. And when I try to buy them a snack, you know, for school, for hiking, for whatever they're doing, it's almost impossible to get something healthy. Um, most of the f nice. most of the desert, whole foods, it doesn't really matter. Ultimately, m most things. In, in when you're talking about transparency, as a physician, I can't even pronounce many of the ingredients that are in our products. So, and you let alone know what they do. And question. the question is. What can, with obesity and pancreatic cancers and a lot of other things that may be tied from a disease standpoint to what we eat, and we are who we eat, um, I didn't really hear much about getting back, get, getting, getting back to a much more uh, fruit, vegetable uh, snack that we can one use. Um, yeah, well, just take baby carrots, for example. You know, we... We uh, sell a lot of baby carrots, but we, we launched a campaign about six years ago called Eat Them Like Junk Food, which the issue was not baby, I think everybody else say baby carrots are pretty healthy. Uh, what we found was that kids especially, we went to schools, we, you know, we went in and executed marketing that looked like Coke marketing. Uh, the amazing thing that happened is consumption went up 14 or 15 percent. So, it, you know, it's both an issue of having a product that, you know, is in my context, you know, fresh, healthy, accessible, as much of a whole food as possible. But the other piece of it is having to market those products, make those products available, affordable. You know, you go into most cities in this country and you go into the inner city, you can't buy any fresh food. It, it simply is not available. And most of what you have available in bodegas and small stores, high salt, high sugar, um, and, and really empty calories. So. You know, I think what we have to do is we have to innovate. We're launching a whole range of healthy snacks, um, you know, hummus, edamame with carrots and, and other fresh vegetables. And, you know, take hummus and a baby carrot and put it together in a single pack. You'd think that was simple. It, it's a very difficult technical challenge to do that and, and be able to deliver that broadly. But at the heart of it, we know that you can take the snacking behavior, you can replace aspects of that snacking behavior with much healthier options, and then you got to build a whole supply chain to do it. That was really what was behind Campbell's purchase of our company. So I, I think we all need to look for those opportunities. And, you know, we were with Walter Robb yesterday. And Walter, I'll send him a note after we get done with this. I'll tell him that you couldn't find anything healthy in Whole Foods. And I'm you sure, sure you he'll, he'll send you a note. 
be sure you do that. We're going to, because we're in such short time, we're going to have to do group questions. So could you ask your question, immediately pass it to the woman with her hand up uh, behind you in foam green, and then to the woman down here. We're going to have to do a lightning round. So could you make a quick question? Uh, you want to start with Tom? My, my, uh, my question is, who, what metrics uh, are guiding our decisions or your decisions and strategy? Um, many of us are listening to the World Health Organization and all the environmental, social governance and health standards. Um, but I think there's a, a, a demand to listen to consumers instead. And I, we've done work with McDonald's and uh, with, uh, with those guys. What we found was once we showed them the consumers cared about cage-free eggs and all-day breakfast, they changed their thing. So my question is, what data are you using to listen to consumer demand, and how are you um, shifting that versus listening to experts? Right. And data standards? metrics, again, it's us in the media who determine all of their okay. changes. Remember, yeah. we think well of ourselves. What? Helena? Oh, wait, let me come um, Hi, Helena Bottomiller, Evitz Politico. Um, I'm wondering if you could just briefly say what the, I know Campbell's is committed to GMO labeling uh, going forward, but uh, with, if there is a national solution that includes QR codes as an option, are Nestle and Mars going to look at that option? You're already labeling. I know there's been a lot of complaints about. We are 100% behind. No, no, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> we have to have all the questions that we'll have. It's killing, it's, this is killing me. <laughs> with the words on all your packages in the US uh, going forward, irregardless of what, this, what the federal law is. Okay, metrics, GMO labeling, last question. We're going to try to combine all three. And who wants to do? Um, Consumer, I can do. Okay, first. Yeah, thanks. I wonder if you could give us your personal views on soda taxes, Mexico, Berkeley, Philadelphia. What is the best thing Coke and Pepsi could do that they're not already doing to address the toxic food environment? That. <laughs> Sorry. Um, do we want to start with Jeff on soda tax, or do you want to reformulate your answer? Um, look, the, the data seems to be pretty clear on soda taxes, and Philadelphia just the first major city to pass them, that they reduce consumption. And in, in high uh, consumption territories, high per capita consumption territories, especially with sugar soft drinks, we need to reduce consumption. Paul, sorry, Fiona? I can take the question on consumer if you want. I mean, at the end of the day, the consumer is rooted in the heart of everything we do. So we're responding to consumers, not to, people will often say, is this a fear of taxation? Is this a, a fear of regulation, legislation? Our consumers are looking for this. We have the metrics to back it up. And then we will look for solutions. So the solutions are coming from the experts in terms of science and nutrition. But at the end of the day, it's what our consumers want. And that's why we're, why we're doing it. And Paul, GMO labeling and going forward, you were? Full, full commitment, if I understood the question, but full, full commitment to um, basically communicating openly and transparently, not just about GMOs. I mean, by the way, if you've actually, um, uh, to the end of, and I'm going to mix in with the gentleman who said, where do you get your data from in terms of consumers? Um, people still write these amazing things called letters. Uh, we have, you know, email. People love to phone us as well. At the back of every single one of our packs is a thing called good to know. At the, f by the end, year to date, from uh, January to the end of May, we would had 206,000 direct contacts through consumer care. And literally every day, those consumer contacts, uh, they're reviewed hourly in case there's any incidents that come through. They're reviewed every day. And I review every single consumer contact uh, every week so that we drive it. Interestingly, uh, GMO from January to uh, the end of May was 0.08% of the total calls that we were asked for. The need for information across a wide variety of topics, one of the big ones for, for us is where do you source from? People are so interested in sourcing. Because they want to know if you buy some, if they buy a, a, where did you get this cheese? Did you get this cheese from China or Malaysia? Or actually, did you get it up from up the road in, uh, in Wisconsin somewhere? So at the end of the day, what we want is the, and I'm very supportive of the legislation that's being put forward. I think it's a good compromise for, for everybody. It is a compromise. Not everybody's going to be happy. But what it gives us is it gives us transparency of information right across the spectrum. And that's, when it comes back to my point earlier, transparency has got to be good for everybody. 
We have had such a good conversation with our seminar size, incredibly committed audience that we want to continue <laughs> for an hour, but Colleen's not going to let us because the master of the entire Ideas Festival is, uh, has honored us with her presence. And so I'm going to have to thank you all for coming. Invite us all to continue the conversation. Food and Society at Aspen will be continuing it. And thank you very much to our distinguished panel for thank coming you. to Aspen. Thank you. For all of you.